Well, we're going to start. Next, we have an exposition from Miss Mary the Despins, which represents NARIT, which stands for La Asociación National Association of Fideicomiso Real Estate Investment Trust, and gives us a, an equivalent of Fibras in English. Nuredes is vice president to the education to the investment and leads the it was for NERIT for the investors, institutional investors, global wise. Even more so with the markets of pensions and consulting and assess. And Mary, this comes from the sector of investment and capital and in real estate, commercial real estate. Mary, could you pass to the front? 
Thank you, thank you, and good morning. Uh, I am Meredith Despens. I'm Vice President of Investment Affairs and Investor Education uh, at NAREIT. Um, and first, I want to thank you all for your time and attention uh, in listening to what I might have to say today. And I want to thank Fibrian, especially for the opportunity to participate in this afternoon's uh, uh, Investor Day activities and help further their efforts and provide some additional education on the REIT approach to real estate investment. Um, so um, what I'd like to do uh, is really talk about three things or focus my comments on three areas this afternoon. Uh, first, maybe I'll give a, a little bit of an introduction and overview of NAREIT, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts, who we are, what we do, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with us. Um, then I'd like to give a perspective on global property investment and the important role that REITs and publicly traded real estate vehicles are providing uh, in, in global property investment. And then I'm going to narrow the focus uh, to specifically talk about the U.S. REIT industry, uh, how give you a, a perspective on how and why REITs were created in the United States, what it takes to, to be a REIT today, uh, and share with you some information about how the industry has grown and evolved over its 55 years. Um, so with that, NAREIT is a nonprofit industry association. We represent the REIT and publicly traded real estate industry. We're based in Washington, D.C. Um, our mission is very simple. It's to preserve, promote, and perfect the REIT approach to real estate investment. Um, we are a membership-based organization. Uh, we have about 40 uh, uh, employees, and we're organized along four major business uh, lines. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a very active governmental affairs group, Policy and Politics, and they maintain communications with and focus on educating uh, various legislative bodies, regulatory authorities, accounting authorities, et cetera. Uh, we have a finance and operations area who provide services to our members and to the industry. We have a communications team that uh, is focused on um, providing liaison to the media. Uh, and then last but not least, and near and dear to my heart, is our research and investor outreach efforts um, where we share research that NAREIT does internally as well as on a sponsored basis with research partners um, and with academicians with the real estate investor market in general. NAREIT sponsors uh, uh, to uh, a number of networking and educational forums each year, um, providing opportunity for the industry to come together share information on the markets, talk about challenges, trends, opportunities. I've identified a couple of them here on this slide. Um, REIT Week is our annual investor conference. It takes place in June each year. This year it'll be in New York City. About 2,000 people attend, and it really is a wonderful opportunity to, um, it, it, I, I think of it as a total immersion opportunity into the REIT world, and it's a great educational uh, uh, forum. Um, the second major event we provide for investors is our annual conference, which is called REIT Wise. That takes place in the fall each year. This year it'll be in November in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, as I said, NARI is a membership-based organization. We have about 2,000 members globally. We have individuals who are members, and then we have corporate members. And I, I sometimes think of our corporate members as the backbone of the organization. These are the REITs themselves. And our membership, NAREIT's membership, is as diverse as the REIT industry is. So we have U.S. REITs who are members, we have non-U.S. REITs who are members, and the U.S. REIT industry in, in the, US, the U.S. REIT industry is quite diverse in and of itself. 
So we have public REITs who are our members, public REITs whose shares are listed on stock exchanges, public REITs whose shares are not listed on stock exchanges, and we have purely private REITs as members. And NAREIT is the industry organization, represents the interests of all those constituents. Um, and, and while NAREIT is based in the US, um, it's fair to say that um, investing in commercial real estate has become a global uh, phenomenon, and NAREIT's activities uh, have become increasingly global as investors are looking to diversify their portfolios globally as well. And um, today, uh, the REIT model has expanded over the years and, and is now uh, 31 countries have established REIT or REIT-like structures. Uh, the United States was the first country to establish REITs back in 1960, uh, followed by New Zealand and the Netherlands in 1969. And then we saw a, a, a fairly rapid, uh, more rapid expansion of the REIT model since the early 1990s. And I think that's very much consistent with the increasingly global nature of property investment. I think the expansion of REITs globally is further validation of the success and sustainability of the REIT model as a way for investors around the world to access the benefits of the real estate asset class. So with 31 countries having REIT or REIT-like structures, um, are there elements that they all share in common? Um, and while they certainly do vary from country to country, uh, and, and, and it's important that they do vary from country to country because to have a successful REIT model, it has to be able to accommodate um, a whole constellation of, of factors within each market, right? It has to fit with the capital market situation. It has to fit with the overall economic situation of the market. It has to fit with cultural differences that occur from market to market. And it has to fit with sort of overall investor sentiment. So there are differences among these, these REIT models, but there are also some similarities. And what I've outlined on this page is what we call sort of the four elements of a well-defined REIT. So in general, all of these REITs are going to, uh, their, their stock ownership is going to be broadly held, widely held. They're not like closely held companies. They all must demonstrate that they are, in fact, in the real estate business. And what we mean by that is the majority of both assets and income must be real property or real estate related. A majority of the profits um, or income need to be distributed on an annual basis to the shareholders of the REIT. And the sh it is the shareholders, not the REIT entity itself, that typically pay tax on the income that is distributed by the REIT. So um, those are sort of the overarching principles of a well-defined REIT globally. And um, I just wanted to point out that that is very consistent with what the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, has outlined in its model tax convention. Um, and I've excerpted some language from that. And essentially it says the same thing. A REIT is an entity um, that's widely held, that de de derives its income from property, that distributes that income to shareholders, and, in, and the entity therefore does not pay tax on the income it distributes. Um, as I mentioned, I think, you know, especially in recent years, uh, investors are looking for ways to diversify their investment portfolio globally. And real estate, uh, I think investors are, are recognizing as an important asset class. They're looking for broader diversification in order to help them manage risk uh, and also to help them achieve the potential for higher investment returns. 
real estate globally uh, on a developed markets basis is estimated to be about a $20 trillion USD market. So it's a very large component of the overall investment opportunity set. Um, it's a very important investment in commercial real estate is a very important way to participate in the economy. When you think about commercial real estate, one way to think about it is it houses the global economy. You know, people shop in stores, they live in apartment buildings, they stay in hotels, etc. So by investing in commercial real estate, you're investing in the global economy. And I think increasingly, um, uh, REITs around the world are able to provide investors with not only exposure to the commercial real estate asset class in a very easy and efficient manner, but they're providing dividends, portfolio diversification, liquidity, transparency, and competitive performance. Certainly investment characteristics that, um, while we're never overlooked, have, have become at the forefront of, I think, many of investors' minds since the great financial crisis in particular. Um, this is a picture of, of one global index. It happens to be the FTSE EPRA NAREIT global index of families. Um, there are a number of, of indexes uh, that track the performance of REITs. There are over 200 ETFs and mutual funds um, dedicated to REIT investment, many of which are built on, uh, on the FTSE Upper and REIT Global Index family, uh, as well as a number of others. So next, uh, as I said, I'd like to narrow the focus a little bit um, to talk about the U.S. REIT industry, uh, why they were created in the U.S., um, provide you with an overview of the rules uh, that a company must meet and adhere to in order to become and remain a REIT. And then, as I said, talk about how the industry has changed and grown and evolved uh, over the last 55 years. Um, so REITs were established in the United States it's in September 1960. President Eisenhower signed them into law as part of the Cigar Excise Tax Act. Um, and in fact, um, NAREIT was established as an organization on the day after REIT legislation went into place in the United States. REITs were created essentially as a way to democratize investment in commercial real estate, intended to provide everyone with the opportunity to access the benefits of the real estate asset class, not just the very wealthy, but uh, people from all walks of life. And I think, you know, looking back 55 years, REITs have been successful by building communities. REIT-based investment helps literally tens of millions of Americans save for their retirement. Um, and they've been, uh, they promote economic growth by very effectively channeling capital and efficiently channeling capital into commercial real estate. Um, the uh, one thing I would note is the um, decision to become a REIT is a voluntary election. So a company makes the voluntary election under United States Internal Revenue Service Code to become a REIT. Um, and the REIT must clearly demonstrate that it is in the real estate business. It has to pass certain ownership, income, asset and distribution requirements, not only to become a REIT, but to maintain its status as a REIT. Um, from an ownership perspective, like that well-defined, that list of well-defined uh, REIT guidelines I shared earlier, REITs must be broadly held. U.S. REITs need to have a minimum of 100 shareholders <clears throat> and no more than 50% of the REITs stock can be held by five or fewer investors. It's the five or fewer rule. U.S. REITs need to show that at least 75% of its total assets are real estate and that a minimum of 75% of its gross income is derived from real property 
or mortgages in real property. And finally, and, and arguably, I think most importantly, a REIT needs to adhere to certain income distribution requirements in order to continue to qualify as a REIT. In the US, REITs need to distribute uh, a minimum of 90% of their tax, uh, taxable income annually in the form of a dividend to shareholders. Now I know in the FIBRA market, it's a little bit different, it's 95%, but in the US, it's 90%. Having said that, in reality, most REITs distribute more than 90% each year, and in fact, many distribute uh, at a minimum 100% of their taxable income each year in the form of a dividend to the shareholders. Um, in return for that, uh, the REITs receive a dividends paid deduction, which means they don't pay tax, the REITs don't pay tax on the income that they no longer have, on the income that they've distributed to their shareholders. Generally speaking, it is the shareholders, the taxable shareholders, who then would pay tax on the dividends that they receive from the REIT. So in addition to these ownership, asset, income, and distribution requirements, um, there are some other guidelines that U.S. REITs, uh, that generally apply to U.S. REITs, and, I, and I've identified them here on this slide. Uh, generally, U.S. REITs must hold their properties for the long term. They can't be engaged in trading or act as a broker or, um, or flipping properties, using a, a popular term. It, they, they're, they're incented to take a strategic approach to, to the property portfolio. Um, Secondly, there are no mandated guidelines or restrictions on the use of leverage by U.S. REITs. Um, the current industry average is about 45, is about 34 percent as of, as of the end of February, which is below the historic industry uh, uh, level, which is closer to 45 percent. Um, We've seen, again, especially since the 2007, 2008, the financial crisis, uh, a significant delevering uh, among REITs. Now, obviously, there's a lot of variability uh, between companies. For example, public storage in the U.S., I believe, uses zero debt. There are other companies that use, you know, more debt, and it varies by company, it varies by property sector, but on average, the U.S. REIT industry's debt uh, leverage level is, is 34% today. Um, U.S. REITs can be either internally or externally managed. Uh, today, the vast majority of U.S. REITs are internally managed. And this is interesting, this is one of those evolutionary uh, to a certain degree, one of those evolutionary uh, elements that has taken place in the industry. When REITs were first created in 1960, they had to be externally advised. It wasn't until 1986 with the um, enaction of the Tax Reform Act that allowed REITs to become internally managed. And now today, as I said, most REITs, the majority of U.S. REITs, are internally managed. It's the direction that the market um, uh, had the, the industry move. Um, REITs in the U.S. can be organized as either a corporation or a business trust. Here again, most REITs are organized as corporations. About three-quarters of the industry are, are organized as corporations. As I said, the, uh, the U.S. REIT industry is, is quite diverse. Um, it is made up of public and private companies, listed and non-listed companies. We have equity REITs. We have mortgage REITs. Um, public REITs uh, are those companies who are registered with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Private REITs are not. Public REITs can either be listed and their shares traded on the stock exchanges, or they can be uh, publicly registered but not listed. 
In the public sector, uh, publicly traded REITs, REITs who shares trade on stock exchanges, is the largest part of the industry. Uh, as I said, there are both equity and mortgage REITs. This is another one of those evolutionary things. In the early days of the REIT industry, the industry was dominated by mortgage REITs. Today, 90% uh, of the industry are equity REITs, roughly. So we've seen uh, the market move, move more strongly toward equity uh, REITs versus mortgage REITs. Um, and then uh, the, the, the other evolutionary trend we've seen, so REITs can be either diversified, hold a diversified portfolio of properties, different property sectors, different property types within the portfolio, or they can be focused on a, on a, a specific property sector. And what we've seen is while there, there continue to be a number of diversified REITs, uh, there has been a trend toward more specialization uh, and we see REITs now focusing on specific property sectors. This slide I'm not going to spend a lot of time on because we've already talked about it. It essentially says the largest segment of the public market, uh, public REIT market, are exchange traded REITs. They have to comply with the SEC requirements, uh, reporting and disclosure requirements, et cetera. Um, and the reason why I, I included this is. From this point forward, I'm going to be speaking almost exclusively about publicly traded, exchange traded REITs. So this is a chart that shows the growth in the equity market capitalization of the US REIT industry. Uh, and along the way, I've outlined a few key milestones that were catalysts for growth. Um, one thing I'll point out is the chart starts in 1971. Well, you say, why is that, Meredith? Because REITs were established in 1960 in the US. Well, the reason for that is, is for the first couple of decades of the REIT industry in the United States, it was really very tiny. Not a lot was going on, and not a lot of people really cared about it. <laughs> but uh, again, you can see that, that it's grown, and it's grown quite dramatically. Um, you know, there's there's, there's no one right way when you develop a REIT model, right? And so, you know, it's taken its twists and turns, and I think over the 55 years REITs have been in existence in the United States, we've, uh, we've, we've I'm sure, made our fair share of mistakes and, and hopefully have learned from them. So I've called out a few milestones here. The first uh, I mentioned previously is the 1986 Tax Reform Act that allowed internal management that was one of the catalysts for growth in, in the industry. The second milestone I've called out here is uh, 1992, which was the, the creation of the first UPREIT structure. And I'm not going to go in, for the purposes of this, uh, this conversation, I'm not going to go into the technical details, nor am I an ex expert on the UPREIT structure. But essentially what it did was it provided property owners with uh, some advantages, some tax benefits, when they contributed properties to the REIT. So that removed a barrier, allowed more properties to flow into the REIT structure, and again was a catalyst for, for growth in the industry. And then the third milestone I've pointed out here is um, uh, in 1993, there was a reinterpretation of that five or fewer rule. Now remember I said the five and fewer rule states that no more than 50% of a REIT shares can be held by five or fewer investors. Now that was a real impediment to institutional capital flows into, into the US REIT industry, and in particular pension funds. Because a pension fund, prior to this reinterpretation, was, was considered a single investor, and so Pension funds couldn't invest in, into REITs because they hit that five or fewer barrier. When the, the, the rule was reinterpreted, it essentially looked through the pension fund to the plan participants and the beneficiaries. And once that interpretation was adopted, there was a strong inflow and continues today to be a strong inflow from uh, pension funds into, into the REIT space. 
And then you can see um, you know, the growth through the, through the 90s, the modern REIT era. REITs were added to the uh, S&P indexes in 1990 that spurred additional growth. Today, this is, this is a picture of the FTSE, nay REIT, all REIT index. Uh, the total market cap is 953 billion. And that was at the end of February. Um, there are 220 REITs in the index, 191 of them trade on the New York Stock Exchange with an equity market cap of those REITs of about 900 billion. Um, the growth we've seen has come um, uh, from share price appreciation. REITs, US REITs have done really well and rebounded very strongly since 2009. So share price appreciation is a part of it, but we've also seen growth, new companies, new types of companies, becoming REITs, um, so, so solid organic growth. This is a picture of what the US REIT industry looks like today. It's very broadly diversified by both uh, geographically and by property sector. The map shows, uh, if this was a little more granule, you would see 40,000 dots. REITs own some 40,000 properties across the United States. The table shows how the REIT industry is organized by property sector. Roughly 50% of the equity REIT industry is invested in what we call, or what has been traditionally thought of as the core property types. So that's multifamily residential or apartment properties, retail properties, office properties, and industrial properties. Uh, the other half of the industry is, is more diversified, and, and the industry has certainly become more diversified of late with growth in sectors like lodging, healthcare, data centers, timber, uh, infrastructure, and, 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 and on balance, that's, that's a very healthy thing for the commercial real estate industry, and for investors, it's providing them with the ability to access asset classes that they may not otherwise have been able to do if they weren't uh, available through the public markets. So um, I think what makes REITs so attractive uh, to investors is a combination of both operating and investment characteristics that are largely driven by the actual REIT model. And on these next couple of pages, I've identified some of those uh, characteristics or benefits of invest in, investing in listed REITs. Um, certainly liquidity, transparency, and, and strong corporate governance um, uh, have played a very important role uh, in the minds of investors. In terms of liquidity, uh, average daily trading volume on US REITs is $7 billion. $7 billion a day average daily trading volume. That's as of February of this year. 10 years ago, uh, it was about $1, uh, $1 billion a day average daily trading volume. So we've seen the REIT market grow and become more liquid. Um, transparency, um, operations, financing, again, they're registered with the SEC. They have to comport with disclosure and reporting requirements, but they also provide an important element of market transparency as well. You know, you can drive by a property owned by a REIT. You can see it. It's easy to value. Um, so market and operational transparency are both very important. And then strong corporate governance. Um, the interests of REIT management teams are well aligned with the interests of their shareholders. Some of that owes from their, their, their regulatory oversight that they receive, um, but uh, that is again, uh, has become uh, very much in the forefront of the consciousness of, of many investors. Um, management discipline, because REITs uh, are reliant upon the capital markets and must return to the capital markets to finance their growth. Um, that imposes a discipline on REIT management teams that's very important. Uh, it's a discipline on, 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 on how and where they decide to allocate their equity and debt capital. Um, limited use of debt. 
Uh, the scrutiny of investors, and this uh, in particular with respect to U.S. REITs, investors like more equity and less debt, or have liked more equity and less debt. And uh, companies who um, had higher levels of debt paid the price in lower share prices in, on many, in, in many cases. Um, income distribution. REITs are an important source of income. No, no uh, story about REIT investment performance is complete without talking about the significance of the income component. With US REITs, uh, anywhere from half to two thirds of the REIT total return is income. Uh, and that's critically important in this environment uh, to investors. REITs di uh, distributed 34 billion in dividends in 2013 and over 300 billion over the past 20 years. And then last but not least, the, the important diversification benefit REITs bring to portfolio. REITs historically have a very low correlation with other asset classes and taken in combination are, are an important add to a mixed asset portfolio. So um, with that, we've got about 10 or 15 minutes, I guess. I'm happy to take any questions. I've got a couple other slides in here that talk to some of the investment characteristics that show some historic performance, some analyses that we've done on the diversification benefits of adding REITs, but I'd rather start with questions from you. I was wondering, I don't know if this is on, I think it's on now. Um, I was wondering what NAREIT's role is in, beyond this presentation, which is interesting, what NAREIT's role is when uh, you have a country like Mexico that's gone through a process of forming REIT structures in advising them, and is there, is there an outreach, one? And two, are there countries in Latin America uh, beyond Mexico that are considering REIT structures that have out reached out to NAREIT that you could mention if it's not something that's you know, uh, not of the public record? Um, NAREIT, uh, as an organization, because we've been around for a while, um, does get involved, is happy to get involved with other markets as they contemplate um, developing a REIT structure, or is they going through the process of developing a REIT structure? Um, we are, uh, we don't, our model is not one to go in and establish a REIT chapter um, outside the United States. Rather, what we prefer to do and what we've done is we help to facilitate dialogue with the constituents, with the stakeholders in the various markets um, to not only share with them our experience, but to, to help them communicate about their industry, what things are on their mind, what kinds of issues do they feel they need to focus on. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done that. We're, we're, we're doing that in other markets today. We're, Mexico, we, we we're interested in and happy to help. Um, we're doing something similar in China. We've done it in Europe. Uh, we've worked very closely with the European Public Real Estate Association as the, 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 the REIT and listed property uh, company uh, uh, market has developed in Europe. And all throughout the world, as you've seen, you know, the, 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 the slide with the pretty flags. Uh, but that, that's typically the role that, that NAREIT has taken, to, to work with the stakeholders, to provide as much guidance as we possibly can, um, and, uh, and, and support the growth of like-minded organizations that are supporting the growth of the industry globally. What's good for the U.S. is, it's, is, good, is good for all of us. What's good for all of us is good for the U.S. Could you please expand on the tax benefits of REITs? Who benefits more, the, the REIT itself by passing the income to the individual taxpayers or the individual taxpayers themselves because for some reason they take be benefits from that? 
explain that? Yeah. And, and, and how important is that to the origin and growth of REITs? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a tax advisor, so I may not be able to speak very well to the individual uh, investor perspective. It, one thing I want to make clear, though, is it's, it, REITs are not, it's not a pass-through entity, right? So they're not passing through losses. They're not, it's, it's just that in return for distributing their income, the REIT does receive this dividends paid uh, deduction, which allows it to, to so, so very simply, the REIT then is not paying tax on money that it doesn't have, but rather the shareholder who receives the distribution is paying tax on those dividends at whatever tax rate you know, is applicable to them depending on the type of dividend. I'm not sure that fully answers your question, but it may That's be. okay. Maybe somebody else in the audience uh, might be able to expand more on it for me. I'm just trying to understand why it was set up that way and who benefits. Well, I think, you know, I think, I think everyone benefits, right? Um, because REITs uh, historically provide investors with very strong competitive investment returns. They provide investment investors with a, a source of uh, very stable and, and historically strong income levels. Um, yes, they pay taxes, but presumably you're being compensated for for that tax. Uh, that you're that you're paying, and from the REITs perspective, um, it's it's facilitating their growth and their ability to finance their operations. Thank you. I wonder if you can share some light, and the, if uh, there's any difference between an internally managed REIT and an internally advised REIT. What, what is, is there any difference between internally managed and internally advised, or it's the same concept? Internally, internally managed and internally advised. Uh, yes, you mentioned that. Is that the same thing? It, it, uh, what I mentioned was that there are externally okay. advised REITs and internally managed REITs. Uh, and that in the U.S., it, the company could be either one, uh, whichever they choose. And the market, uh, most REITs today are internally managed, vertically organized. Uh, organized and internally managed. And it's moved in that direction, I think, largely from, uh, you know, that's where the market has taken it. It's where the investors have taken it. Thank you. Just to follow up on that question, why would you say uh, the market has taken it that, in that direction as opposed to what the original regulator intended uh, by allowing only externally managed REITs to exist? I, I, think, I think a lot of it has to do with alignment of interest, that investors are, um, have perhaps become more comfortable that uh, a vertically integrated internally and managed company provides the framework for a better alignment of interest of the REIT management teams with, with the shareholders and um, avoids the opportunity for some conflicts or perceived conflicts of interests that, uh, that may arise through an externally advised Great, type you. of model. Anything else? Meredith, based on um, the track record the U.S. and the international REITs have had, what would be your, what would we say to Mexican Fibras? Like, what should they learn from? Biggest mistakes in terms of shareholder communications, in terms of anything? What would what, you say? Well, I, 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 and this is my sort of my, my, my personal view. You know, surprises are confidence killers in general, right? Not not just in 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 investing, but I think in life <laughs> in general. So uh, you know, I think um, 
transparency, disclosure, um, those types of those types of things are are, are certainly very very important. Um, I am very hesitant. I, I do get asked, well, you know, what what should Fibras do to be better, or what's the right model we should follow? Um, and 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 to your point, you know, REITs in the U.S. have been around so long. Um, it hasn't been a linear path in the way the model has evolved. There is no, perhaps, one right model. But I guess what I would would stress is that, you know, it, while it's important to 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 share the experience, to talk about the lessons learned. Um, it does not mean, therefore, that the, that the US model is the right model for Mexico. Because as I mentioned earlier in my comments, you know, Mexico has a different constellation of capital markets issues, of economic issues, of political and regulatory issues, of you know, cultural issues, so what might seem to be the best thing since sliced bread in the US <laughs> may not be quite so good in, in Mexico or other markets. So, so, so the model needs to be, though, the model needs to be flexible enough to be able to accommodate the dynamics that those various factors uh, are driving. So, and, and you know, in the US, I think the, the uh, the leverage example is, is, is an interesting one in that, as I said, US REITs, there's no restrictions on levels of leverage that they can use. And um, you know, that, that, that's a, that's, that can be a double-edged sword, but you know, the industry finds its way. Uh, you don't want to over-regulate so that the industry can't evolve to meet sort of the, the demands of these uh, of these various factors. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. And we are now starting our third panel, which is we are going to have our moderator, Laura Lozano, our judicial director. And we're going to have this, the, the market and the M BMV and CMV. So now we have the FIBRAS National Banking and Securities Commission and Mexican Stock Exchange. So I'm going to allow myself to introduce our panelists with a biography. Eduardo Flores Herrera, welcome. He is the current VP on Capital Security Supervisor in the National Banking and Securities Commission. He's responsible of public offerings and the supervision of banking markets, debt, and derivatives, including all the byproducts such as compensation chambers, brokers, and debt uh, rating agencies. We have Brian Lebley. He's part of the supervision of securities in the Mexican stock exchange. He has gone through different courses in SEC United States and the Federal Reserve Bank. He is member of committee number one, representing Mexico, committee dedicated to auditing and information uh, disclosure of the national inter 
Organization of Securities Commission. Francisco Valle, welcome, Francisco. He has over 17 years of experience in the Mexican Stock Exchange. He has the different positions, being the last one, directors of provisions and issuers. He has participated in the implementation of global market of secades and fibras. He is a public accountant from the School of Banking and he has also gone through different courses of corporate finances, among others. He has an MBA of management by Universidad La Salle. Guillermo Uribe. Welcome, Guillermo. Guillermo is a lawyer from the Libre de Derecho School. He has dedicated to c customers' representative. During the last years, he has dedicated a large part of his time to the development, structuration of fibras, structuring of fibras, and the acquisition of real estate. portfolio acquisition. So now I would like to ask some questions to our panelists. And we're going to talk about FIBRAS, Mexican Stock Change and National Banking and Security Commission. So my first question is to Guillermo. What are the main concerns about FIBRAS in terms of Mexican legislation? Thank you so much, Laura. I think that we have many concerns we currently have in terms of the legal framework. So. We have recently seen a special regulation designed for fibras. But I believe that one of the most important topics, and this has to do a lot with the previous panel, when we talked about what it is within the US markets and the evolution of rates and how they were originally structures that were in certain manner were managed uh, externally and how during this year's market was able to conceptualize the idea of providing uh, or uh, putting aside some interest conflicts by allowing these reads to be managed from a internally perspective, which means having their own employees they're in charge of the management of the read itself now in Mexico. And I want to put this into context because the uh, Fibras Mexican market is very innovative. We started from 2011 with the first fibra structure. And this is addressing that the market took some time to really being convinced and to convince the owners of big real estate portfolios to participate in a market structure. Now, one of the most important topics for these convincing to be carried out is to provide opportunity towards these uh, real estate market inver investors that ha had already some assets within their patrimony to provide with some taxing uh, benefits. But at that moment, it wasn't enough to have these benefits, but also this, uh, the people that had a lot of fortune from this market, they don't didn't want to just give it and to to lose control about their pro their real estate portfolio. So this has some restriction in the legal framework that means that a trust could have employees and taken it out to a structure of fibras, especially for the management in terms of having an external management. Today, I believe that the challenge is that the market to assimilate the quickest possible that new structures for fibras due to, I believe, this new wave or trend of fibras within the market, it is basically for them to be internally managed fibras. And this is going to address specifically one feature. The new structures of fibras, new formations of fibras are not going to be 
carrying out an important investment of predefined uh, real estate, but that they are going to be vehicles that are going to be integrated with the market resources. And with these resources, you can acquire real estate uh, portfolios without having a controlling group or person people in charge of the management after these uh, portfolios being listed. So from the regulatory perspective, we ha need to be aware that our Fibras model is addressing a market and legal perspective and, and from the regulatory perspective, it should be a period where we get support for these traditional fibrous structures when we have external management structures by design and also for to have a s sort of support for new uh, structures where you have internal management. I believe that we in fact, have the first example last year when, for the first time, we took Fibra to the market and has the trend to be considered as a Fibra internally managed. I believe that this is a trend within the market because uh, real estate portfolios that are currently available are hardly going to take a an external management path. I think that the trend is for it to be internally. I think that Mary did explain it due to the in, in conflict of interests, and uh, I guess that this is going to be uh, leading towards the new models. Some other questions I have is for the National Banking and Security Commission. What are the actions that the National Banking and Security Commission is taking currently to assess the the market with, of fibras in Mexico? As you know, uh, since January last year, we had the financial reform that involved a lot of modification in the financial system, and specifically, the National Bank and the Security Commission had some uh, changes. And something that could help Fibras is the changes related with uh, securities programs and restricted programs. I believe that one the one of programs is that before programs were only about uh, equity, debt equity. So you have to add all the process. And I believe that as, as it has done in all fibras, it's long, expensive processes. But we needed to do that. Now, the programs, what they are going to be allowing is that we have different uh, uh, security. So whatever your nature allows you to do in case of fibras, we can have, we, you can issue uh, debt securities or sedefis that allows you to do capital or equity sedefis and it's or certificate. So instead of having big uh, certificates of big emissions, you can do it during the year whenever you need it. So these will be working for an emi uh, issuing of new issuers or new equities. If your issuing goes to qualified of high, uh, high amount, which is 20 million US dollars, is that the closer you, we can have one for 448 locally. So we believe this is going to help to the speed that they can reach the market. And lastly, recurrent um, issuers. So when you have a program, you can ask whether if you have two years as an issuer and you haven't been sanctioned by law, you can request to pre-authorize your supplements uh, forms. So that doesn't mean that you need to go and ask for authorization for each I issue. But with the pre-authorized um, form, you can use issuer. You just need to notify. And this could also work for debt. Well, debt is already done, but it could also be uh, good for the equities. So I think that you can have a equity emission or issuing in two, three, four days. 
Yes, you can have a recurrent program to issue, for example, the debt issues where you can authorize a supplement a viable rate, a fixed rate in UD. So, for example, if you wanted to do it with capital or equity, you would have to do it plus the capital one. So you would say instead of waiting to emit $300 million with a global offering with all the costs involved, you can say, well, right now I need capital, I need equity for 100 million pesos, so you can do an issue for that amount. So that's an important part to be able to be recurrent that you need to have uh, legal authorization, especially for the capital or equity part. You must have the certificates in the treasury to, call, to, to sell them or to locate them, because if not, the times are not going to work. And speaking about the programs, this could, this could continue like. Okay, yes, you could do an update of the existing program. So the ones that only have debt, they could, you could do an update of them to include equity to them. And also, if you fulfill with the two the years of issuer and the other requirements, you can also ask the recurrent part. We, we're going to run, or that's going to shorten the time for our equity. That's very good. Another question is for the Mexican Stock Exchange. How is it contributing to improve the information about fevers that is spread in the market? Thank you. Well, if the first thing I want to speak about is that we've been working continuously to be able to facilitate information to the different sectors, let's call them, to call them out away, uh, different sectors of people that use information, and particularly for fibras, it's always treated in a different way. And one of the greatest thing, because um, it's to reveal information, it's to pay attention to the formants or the, the what the authorities require for the issuers. In particular, for FIBRA, we've had different dispositions or regulations. We've had new requirements, in particular for the FIBRAs, for example. Just to name an example, it was the level of debt, an XO AA, in which we need to work with the issuers and the commission itself, and also with investments, and to be able to give the information in a clear way, in transparent way. And the, the most important thing is that it's useful for the people that are following this information. So this topic is very important. Number one, to address the needs that are required, that require this regulation. That's a point that we always need to address and take care of. And the second issue that's very important is the information, the financial information. When we have a f new project, product, the financial information needs to be revealed, not in the best way. I'm, I'm ref referring to its practical ways and the way to be able to manipulate the information. Fibras were sending information in a PDF form, which we modified last year. In the first report, uh, the first um, report that was in the beginning of 2014, it was already addressing to the catalogs that the stock exchange would have to re be able to reveal information. And this information nowadays is more geared to the instrument or to the sector to be able to make it easier, to make easier to the access to these catalogs to the emissor. And the most important is that the analysts and the investors, investor, investors could process this information in a faster way more expedited way. And in this way, we can also be, we've been addressing certain requirements and characteristics so that we can move them in basing on the requirements of investors, I mean this information. And nowadays, some months ago, we've made some few changes derived from a requirement from analysts and investors to be able to determine indexes or some formula like FFO you know it very well, the funds from operations, to be able to compare and land information in a better way for this sector. 
And the last area that we are working on is the rights. Likewise, uh, I'm going back to the speaking about when we their new instrument, we need to give them transparency and address the needs of the market. And obviously, with the spreading uh, means, we are going to have rights in reimbursement. And we need to adequate this so that they are easy to read and understand for the great investor public. So we are always in communication with the measures addressing the needs that they have. And the other interaction that we have is to be able to facilitate to the analyst and the great in investor public on how they need to read this information to be able to match it and to arrive to the best proposal for both parties. So obviously, this all this information, we verify it together with the National Banking Commission. And for example, the last adequations of the last changes we made, it was a very important work. And Fibrain helped us a lot to be able to work constantly with the catalogs and the analysts and the investors and the owners or holders of Fibras to be able to give this information. And an important for, uh, t subject to 2016 is the one related to financial information. We've been working with this in the XB, XBDR formats, and we're transforming the information in this new language. Uh, but from 2016, it's mandatory that the issuers send directly this formats. And definitely for the analysts and investors, this is going to be was well, going to make it easier for them to read them and to compare against all other reads or other global reads. And even more so, as we were in the hotel area, in the fibras with hotels and the fibras that are uh, real estate. So, well, something that is important is to homogenize or make the information uh, like and not to change catalogs. It's one sector and all the differences so that we have, we try to reach in, to an agreement with the issuers and if it's necessary, we do those differences. And if not, we consider that generally we can reveal the information to address the sector. Another question that we have is for Holland and Night, which are the areas of opportunity that we can spot in Mexican law? Well, basically, I think that we need to consider that is, we need to have a law framework that is very clearly and conformed specifically for FIBRA. So I, I believe it's already an important market and nowadays attracting the interest of a lot of in investors, not only Mexican, but also foreigners. And I believe there's a great challenge to be able to have a regulatory body specifically designed for the pro product or the instrument that is FIBRAS, which, formally speaking, it comes from a tax regulation and that throughout the time what we was done was to try to accommodate it based on the dispositions that were already existent on the market. And I believe this is an opportunity area that is very important and necessary. And even more so to have that legal security that required a product like Fibras. So I think this is one of the biggest challenge and more important challenge. And I will also mention that there's a need for the authorities to be the ones that really have the capacities by law to be able to regulate fibras and supervise them as market instruments or vehicles, and that they are the ones that Im issue the regulations and the for them to be the ones that regulate and supervise fibras. So we need to be very careful speaking about who is going to be really the regulators and the entities are going to be in charge of supervising fibras as 
market vehicles or market instruments. I think this is a very clear challenge and we need to yeah, make it clear that from the point of view of law politics, we need to make an effort to, to a certain level so that we can define who really are going to be the authorities to regulate fibras in their different stages from the arriving to the market and the supervising of themselves and other practices regulated to the fin finances that they take, that they make. So that, I think that's a very important issue, a subject that needs to be considered from now on. We require this as a market to be able to have the security to know where does this regulation and supervising comes from. I think this is a very relevant or very important subject. Thank you very much, Diego. Does, does anybody have any question for our panelists? <laughs> Take advantage now that we have authorities, our authorities here too. Any other comment or question, additional question? Okay, yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much for your comments. Why do fibras have more restrictions than in the U.S.? Why do you have gaps in the debt in the distributing time? And why don't we make it more openly, like in some places that it's been proven that it, they already, it's already been proven that they work? Well, we've had a revision, and particularly in other markets that we have this kind of vehicle. And speaking about the, the the dividend, it's very very similar to the U.S. and Canada market, but we have a tax law here, which is that is giving this return. But speaking about the debt limits, we we've reviewed other countries in which we have this type of vehicle, and we were able to observe that other Americans have been regulated the, the debt issue or the debt topic of the REITs. We, we review the Asia and other markets, and that's what we observed. And some of them are even higher yet. The, uh, let's say they're leveraging uh, level, it's even higher. We went to 50%. Some of them are in a 30 or 40%, and some of them are using a 60%. So the U.S. has not, uh, they, they don't have this level of debt regulator, but we think it's a healthy practice so that we develop properly this kind of market. So we need to wait for a maturity of it. We, we've, uh, we are only seven fibras, seven instruments in our market. So we expect that we're going to wait for it to have an order in that sense. And that's the reason for which we ex established these limits. And the trend is towards more regulations or less? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I believe there are some changes are coming that we need to be observing the behavior of this kind of instrument. And recently, we already see, saw the mortgage, which has a various variation, the mortgage trust. But we've seen the mortgage REITs, they're, they're landing or they're starting to be used in our country. But I believe that we, if we watch the behavior of these vehicles, we're on the go. We're going to try to adequate each of the situations at present. As we know, the market exchange evolve, evolve more, evolve quicker than the regulation. So we need to be going hands in hands with the, the behavior of this kind of instrument, which the goal of taking care of the investors and also the asset class that we have been developing. Thank you, Brian. Any other question? Something, is there something that the authorities are concerned about the fibra sector? Well, we want them to behave. Well, we do behave, <laughs> so. Uh, well, in general, I think we're okay. At the end of uh, 
they do you have a function in the development of the country and the real estate because of the economic uh, spread and at the end of the day what we're trying to do is that the resources in the market go to the real economy and this could be that a company would receive the money and then the other one is to boost other industries that generate this so the development of the real estate market is very important and this is a way to do it even more so the REITs in this type of vehicles have been for in the market for long years and they have proved that they work so it's this is an operation that at the end of the day does have a basis they are real estate so finally they're m the most tangible and secure uh, investment well you we always have risks and bubbles but in general we see it as a good instrument that that is why we're open we're always open for them to grow or be more and the regulation as Ryan was saying that's a issue about this we prefer to create this regulation so that everybody have a orderly fashion growth instead of waiting for something uh, critical to 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 pass so this was more preventive than reactive so we're very comfortable probably what we're gonna do soon is to make uh, more even more than regulate the regime men more but to make it clearer so because it has been evolving secades and fibras are kind of mixed but as Brian's was saying we do have types of fibers so we don't not only have uh, real estate fibers we now have the trust or the um, mortgage ones so one of the goals is to have a clear regulation for each kind of instrument with its particularities at each need so we believe in general with all the issuers or the market of issuers as you well know we've been working with all the issues for the so that the people can know about this and the quality of reports and everything but this is not a particular s subject to the fibers but in general the transparency of information is something that we're very concerned about i i do agree with eduardo there's some things that help us to have a better evaluation and better spread of information also in generally about all the instruments one is the informa informant of market some instruments have them and some not i think this is something that can be added to the behavior of value and the subject of analysis some years ago we we started a figure of independent analysts which what we did was to replicate a figure that operates very well in London. Through a investor's pool, you can, you're able to have a real follow-up of analysis for the investors and for the market. So for the issuers and the companies that ask for the service, they can have an analysis report in Spanish and English, and they have a minimum base or with international standards that support this analysis and this is shared to thousands of terminals in EEF's net and we know this this channels are to spread information and and we want them to understand that to have a real analysis it's useful for the investors and analysts us as a stock exchange we have been supporting this figure and we are inviting the third parties to to start using or to add themselves to this pool not only like four independent analysts but we're also uh, um, asking the third parties to also spread or disclose this information and nowadays we know that the analysts the analysis that they do is for their clients is not they don't really disclose uh, this information so I consider it and we are in inviting and we do have some third parties that upload information to the website and that is closer to the analyst and so forth. And I think little by little we can start moving forward towards giving better information to the analyst and the investor to give them a plus in different areas about the issuers. As investors, we always have these questions. 
the we always question ourselves if the assets of a fever are really worth what they say they are. So does the authority uh, is the authority going to do something about that to kind of check that there's a real value? How or how can they protect the interests of the investors that regarding that the FIBRA really is worth what they say? This is a complicated issue because this is kind of like the main or core issues because this is reflected in the financial statement. So we always have the audit report that the external auditor asks, and then we have independent evaluations. But it is something that we review. Obviously, we try to make a timely or periodic review of all the issuers. But it's very difficult, uh, even though we do try to, if we see something that doesn't make sense, or we do try to investigate. But it's very difficult here and in the rest of the world. The evaluation of this kind of assets that they have, a, well, which have a subjective character. At the end of the day, this building can be worth a hundred million, and for another, a hundred and twenty. So there's always a margin that could be um, talked about. So th it is something that we are interested in. There's also we have the issue of how much they bought it for, because also being disclosing the price could be something sensitive. So we are aware that there could be some issues or some topics that we need to review. But something that also happens sometimes is that to be able to move all the administrative organ or the administrative body or bureaucratic body, it's difficult. But these are some of the things that we are starting to review. And we're starting to improve the disclosure in the issuers. So that way. Those are the main topics, and we're trying to make our best efforts to review them. I would like to add here about this topic. And I think this is a very um, difficult uh, topic, because at the end of the day, what's the value of the building? That's not only the bricks, it's also the potential income. Maybe if you buy a building in the Reforma Corridor in the Angel of Independencia, which is established at the 50%, maybe you're thinking of a value. But if you, as administrator, have the capacity to take that establishment to the 80, 90, or 100%, that the value is completely different. So that's a topic. Really, if you refer of what the real estate is worth commercially, we have different opinions. So I think in the strict, in the strict sense, the evaluation formally speaking about what is a, an instrument as FIBRA is, is really what the market gives them and the financial information that they report. If they tell you that they bought in real estate and stabilized at 95% and after two tax exercises, the behavior does not prove a growth but on the contrary, they have a loss in occupancy, then the sanction it really has to be given by the market or the analyst. Those are the ones that are really the one that are going to tell you how much the real estate is more worth. The real investor that is buying the certificates in the, at the stock exchange, he knows the return that is giving the return he's getting is not being good, so he's the one that's going to put the price to that real estate. Any other questions? To standardize FIBRAS, how do you see this process? I would say that catalog is already there, financial information is already there. We have worked with the commission analyst and we work everywhere with people and it's ready and I believe that we addressed each one of the needs to standardize financial statements so starting from 2016 we are going to have BRD format and but right now we have modified the format and we already adequated some or uh, modified some Thanks to make it easier for the investors to read the, it, but it's already in there. Any comments from our panel? 
Thank you so much, Eduardo, Brian, Francisco, Guillermo. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very glad to say hi again. Just to close, I would like to talk to you about my side, which is the Fibra Inns vision, or Fibra in View. It's been two years since these adventures started. We wanted to be a public company, and we understood that to have the success in the hotel industry, we needed to go to the most efficient funding source, which is the stock market. We are sure that we didn't make the wrong decision. We chose the right path. Those days, we we reached those dreams that fa where we were facing a very challenging market. We can share now that we have met each one of the objectives that we set in our first anniversary and our initial public instruments. So I would like to show you some outcomes. We have 34 properties, 30 ones in operation, and four in development. Pay attractive payments for our investors. We are the public hotel industry that has paid the highest rate to our investors rate modifications, Fibrain got rid of the commission of 3% and made the uh, pertinent adequations or adaptations. The highest number of global brands, we went from 2 to 12 brands, internationally recognized. The, the geographic div diversion, we started with six regions in the country. And now we have currently 14 states operating specifically in the central part in Mexico, where we have the highest activity in the country. Constant improvements on the operational instances. We have the, the highest profitability in the market. But all this is now history. Looking forward for a period 2014-2015, challenges are not lower. So to be able to duplicate our f portfolio, we have established a strategy that put us on the right path to achieve our objectives on the presentations that we have shared with you. We have gone through the management measurements that we'll be adapting from the management to reach our set goal. I would like now to go through the uh, measurements that I would adopt so to achieve our long-term goals efficiently. Our measurements are the following. Make sure that the expansion of our portfolio is carried out according to quality and profitability criteria that we have achieved so far. We are make sure that these investments are going to go complying with Fibra in compliance and uh, to serve our guest on those areas that we have defined it as a strategic in our country, to improve our uh, corporate governance, to warranty the implementation of best practices in the industry. As example of this, recently we made the decision of separating roles of the president of the technical uh, committee and the general di director, and we have enforced our organization with first level professionals, strengthen the strategic group of Vibra Control with the objective of reaching strategic alliances that will generate value for our investors. On the other hand, we address our commitment to increase the size of Fibra by increasing our capital or our equity. We have now almost $1 billion. I would like to thank our investors participating on the subscription of last November by uh, putting their trust in Fibra. And thanks to this transaction, we are in a place to comply our long-term goals to be able to reach 60 hotels at the end of 2016. 
for the equity market is really important, the liquidity of Fibra in. And once more, we have heard and we are doing the possible in our hands to increase the uh, liquidity. And we're going to continue with our promotion efforts at international level to incentive a virtuous cycle that would generate liquidity with a higher base of investors. We are now working along with our market former and with other support for the support of the imaging agencies, PR, etc., to increase the vi the visibility, the interest, and long-term liquidity. Finally, it's not anything else to say but to thank for your participation and your interest in Fibra In. We are sure that this new period is going to be better than the last one. And in next year, we will see each other again with more success to be celebrated. Partners, colleagues, investors, and specifically for our collaborators that are part of Fibra In team, Thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance. And we would like to invite you to go to next next room so we can have lunch. Thank you. <laughs>